Okay, so we're going to do part two of the Green New Deal. So why are we talking about this still, right? Because they already voted on it and it did not pass. It was zero to 57 days. Um, so the reason we're still talking about this is because one, I told you I'd do a video on it, but two, I don't, even though it was voted on already and the proposal did not pass, um, it is not going to be the last time we hear about this. So we're going to talk about it some more um, because I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. So let's talk about this. Um, so the uh, Green New Deal, as I told you in the previous video, um, really it's about economic overhaul. So it's a lot of people have this misconception that it's just about green energy and green initiatives. It is not. The vast majority of the bill is um, to address economic issues. So, um, so if you're curious about what the Green New Deal is, I did a Green New Deal part one. Um, you can see it on my channel. Um, so we're going to do part two today, which I told you would be focusing on those green initiatives. So if you remember the New Deal, it's a throwback to the 1930s, uh, the New Deal um, that was uh, proposed by President Roosevelt um, and initiated to stimulate the U.S. economy during the Great Depression. This Green New Deal um, is trying to not stimulate a stagging economy or a depressed economy, but rather just to overhaul the whole bloody system. Um, and there are green initiatives in it. Um, again, the vast majority of the, um, of the proposal was economic uh, overhaul, but the green portion is in there, and that's what we're going to address tonight. So let's talk about this. Um, the Green New Deal, so the green portion, the initiatives that were being discussed uh, to um, in the proposal. So one of the biggest ones was the, was the uh, trains. So what about them? Well, the proposed plan was to get rid of as many domestic flights as possible. International flights would still be needed, but um, it was argued that the domestic flights were not needed and that they just consumed a ton of uh, fossil fuels and they polluted the air. Um, it was not good for um, the environment. And so then the solution of how we would travel uh, was to use high-speed trains. Now, why is this not feasible? It's uh, several different factors uh, cause this not to be a feasible plan. One, um, in order to um, have high-speed rail everywhere, you would need to uh, create new infrastructure to lay down new railways. And that is a ton of steel. You would have to mine so much ore uh, to create the steel, which would cause mass uh, emissions, and then, um, and then lay down the tracks. And to lay down the tracks, you would probably have to have permanent changes to the landscape, which means you would have to do blasting, um, you would have to carve uh, through mountains. And so you would permanently change the environment um, to make accommodations for the, you know, to lay down the tracks. You would have to produce all the steel in order to uh, lay down the tracks. Um, and so, and that's an enormous cost on top of that. So um, the current infrastructure we have right now that is used for like cargo freight trains um, it, that that wouldn't be enough. We would have to we would have to uh, have a whole new infrastructure for trains if we were to use them as our uh, primary travel across the country. Um, and so that would defeat, to a large extent, a lot of a green initiative. It would cause a lot more emissions. Um, we would have to do a lot more mining um, for metals and. Um, and then, like I said, you would permanently change the landscape uh, 
in order to accommodate for that infrastructure. So that's not really feasible. That almost defeats the whole purpose of trying to be green, right? On top of that, you have got a, a big deficit in speed and time. So um, if you look at high-speed rail as opposed to planes, so planes, you know, can go upwards of 800 miles an hour. Uh, trains, the ones um, when I was researching this, uh, the highest speed was um, over 300 miles an hour, um, just, but it wasn't too much over the 300 miles an hour uh, mark. And so you're talking about, it's a 500 hour deficit in time. Um, and if time is money, that's a lot of money that's costing uh, the U.S. And so that's a, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big problem. So multiple fronts. Um, it causes an issue. Um, on top of that, the cost, again, because it, it always comes back to money, right? So the cost uh, for this type of plan doesn't, I mean, again, there's no funding mechanism for this. So, so on multiple fronts, this is not an efficient solution um, to basically replace uh, flight with high-speed rail when high-speed rail it doesn't come even close to the speed that um, airplanes provide, and so uh, which helps to cut travel time by a substantial amount. So, and most people I know, especially since we're used to planes, we're we're not going to give up. Uh, we're not going to give up um, that type of convenience for rail, and especially since the the infrastructure is not even laid down. Now, again, this is something that um, the congressperson that proposed the plan they would like to see happen in 10 years. Again, not really feasible. Um, on top of that, with the trains and plane situation, um, the proposal also wanted to get rid of fossil fuels that would be off of fossil fuels in 10 years. Now, this is where, again, I don't, this wasn't, this proposal was not thought out. If you actually read through the proposal, it really was not eloquent in the way it was written. Um, not that bills are meant to be eloquent, but it was just really, just really rough to read through. Um, and so fossil fuels, okay, that powers pretty much everything uh, that we consume right now. Um, cars, how we get around to, I mean, transporting ourselves, transporting our goods and services, that's all done on fossil fuels. Um, the whole East Coast relies on oil for heating, which is why when the uh, East Coast gets a really bad storm, oil spikes in price um, because they know it's going to get consumed trying to heat up uh, the buildings back on the East Coast. Um, and so, and then, you know, for power, we use uh, we use coal, we use oil, um, and then uh, there's talk of trying to go back to nuclear power for um, for uh, for generating power uh, to consumers. Which I mean, obviously that's also used as well, but they're thinking more towards that. Um, even more so than we are now. And and the Green New Deal, however, is saying to get rid of all of that. That's great, but what are you gonna replace it with? Uh, and there's talk of, well, you would replace it with renewable resources like solar and wind. Okay, so the um, green energy sector actually came out against the plan, against this proposal, because they said it was too extreme. There's not the infrastructure uh, to be able to make this happen within 10 years. You're talking about consumers having to basically go to a power source that doesn't exist to heat their homes. Um, so although solar panels exist, um, there's not a way for us to store, you know, the extra power right now. All the all all homes and buildings would have to basically have a, a backup battery to store. Um, all the extra energy, um, which we don't have, and um, and to create all of this, it would um, cause a lot of emissions. Now, somebody, so one of the um, comments that I had recently 
asked, well, what's your proposal then to be, you know, uh, to have zero emissions? Well, the truth is right now at this point, you can't be zero emissions. You can be carbon neutral, um, but you can't be, and even that's very difficult, just even to be carbon neutral is very difficult, but you can't be zero emissions because right now net, the technology does not exist for us to be zero emissions and we don't have the infrastructure for it. So, so it gets to be, it gets to be very difficult um, trying to implement this type of plan on this type of scale when Again, the infrastructure and the technology isn't there to do it. Um, and this would be a huge cost to consumers. Okay, who's going to foot the bill for, uh, you know, individual batteries for your home and and for buildings, for schools and for uh, individual residences and for businesses? Like, who's going to foot the bill for that? Because that's not cheap. You would have to rewire your whole house for solar and a battery. Um and again, we wouldn't even be carbon neutral at that point to produce that m many batteries. Uh, you know, with the current technology that we have, it would be a battery uh, that we would have to store our extra energy in. That that requires a lot of power to make those batteries. Um, so it's just the plan isn't feasible. And again, I don't know where the idea of 10 years came from, but it's also not very um, realistic, to be honest. Um, so that was part, these were the big parts of the green portion. Um, and of course, the whole cow thing to, you know, um, pardon me, to not eat meat uh, or not eat beef um, and to eat more plant-based diets. Um, so again, those were some of the big ones. Um, why is this economically not efficient? So I already told you about the infrastructure stuff, uh, stuff uh, and the cost that would uh, both intrinsic and financial um, cost to having this type of uh, proposal being pushed through. But on top of that, so the other portion of the Green New Deal was that there would be a creation of 29 million jobs, 29 million. Okay, that's about eight, nine percent of the entire U.S. population. That's a lot. That is, that is a ton of jobs. Um, and to create that, the idea was to create that and kind of store it as uh, kind of a, you know, employment storage bank. Um, and we would pull those out when the economy is doing really bad um, and create those jobs for uh, the American people so that it would kind of help to stimulate the economy. Okay, that's a great idea in theory, but if you are trying to get the U.S. Um, to be super green with this green initiative within 10 years, you wouldn't be able to store those jobs. Those would have to be in effect in, and live in the U.S. economy. And so um, you couldn't just sideline them. So why is this a problem? Well, one, there's actually multiple reasons why this is a problem. So one, the green energy sector, this is also part of the reason that they were not for this bill. There's not 29 million jobs worth of work to do in the green sector uh, as it stands right now. And so um, to, and that's, that was, Part of the proposal, this 29 million jobs would have been all in the green sector. It would not have been in all the sectors in the U.S. It was all meant for the green sector. So they were opposed to this because, again, they don't even have 29 million jobs worth to to of demand um, and of need at this point. And so that's a problem. Um, so where what would these people be doing if there's not 29 million? jobs worth of demand. Um, and two, um, to have 29 million jobs um, going live in the U.S. economy when we are not in a recession, we're not in a depression, um, that one, we don't even have the workforce for this. Um, although there are still people who are unemployed, the unemployment rates between, you know, three and four percent, that's a big 
dramatic difference from 8 to 9 percent uh, that the 29 million jobs uh you know, wants to, or the Green Proposal, Green New Deal wants to propose creating. So, um, so we are pretty much at uh, almost full, I said almost, almost full capacity or full employment. Now, in theory, full employment exists, but in reality, full employment does not exist um, because you always have people who uh, are not either able to work or who don't want to work. Um, and, uh, and then people who can't work. So, so there's, uh, so the 29 million jobs is also just economic. It's just not feasible. Um, we don't have that type of labor force right now in the U S. Um, and so it also, uh, because unemployment is fairly low historically right now. Um, and there are a lot of job openings still, What's happening is if you created that, then the public sector and the private sector uh, would be competing for workers. Now, that would be great for the workers because then they could, you know, negotiate for higher wages. But we really don't have the workforce to split between that, you know, the demand for the private sector and the demand for the public sector if you were to create 29 million jobs in the public sector. So it just again, it's not feasible um, in this case. And so um, there's just uh, there's just a lot of um, holes with this uh, proposal, which is why you know it didn't pass. Um, there was really not enough support for it. In fact, um, surprisingly, Obama came out against um, this proposal, not in so many words. Um, Obama came out and said, "Hey, that's great that you know." Uh, there's all these new bold ideas, but without having it being without a funding mechanism and without having it being a huge cost to the American people, um, if it's a huge cost to the American people and it, there's no funding mechanism, it's it's not it's not a feasible plan. And so and there again was no funding you know mechanism for this. Now in the proposal, it did state that they would look at taxing corporations at 90%, not individuals, but corporations. And of course, um, high income earners at 70%. Now, the problem with this um, type of proposal, when you're talking about taxing corporations at 90%, a um, couple of things. One, the tax from um, corporations would still not be enough to fund all of these initiatives, okay? The 29 million jobs alone, I mean, you're talking trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of projects that would have to be created in order to uh, create 29 million jobs. And where would they get the money for that? Well, if you look at the taxes, 90% of corporations, uh, I'm sorry, taxes on corporations at 90%, it still wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't even come close to covering this bill, um, covering the cost of this uh, of this initiative. And so that wouldn't work. But on top of that, the um, the other fallacy of the ninety percent uh, tax rate is that you are making the assumption that the corporations would stay within the U.S. That they would just be like, oh sure, we'll go ahead and take ninety, get you know, hit with ninety percent. Uh, taxes. They are forgetting the small, you know, word called mobility. Okay, if if they if the U.S. ever decide to tax corporations at that high of a level, I can guarantee you, these corporations would move, and there are countless countries that would be more than happy to welcome them with open arms. Because uh, why would you? Why would you stay in the U.S. if you were getting taxed at 90 percent and you could go to a different country and not pay those taxes? Now, a lot of people are like, well, you know, the um, technology is here and blah, blah, blah. OK, first of all, the vast majority of technology being many, uh, that we use, it's manufactured outside the U.S., Okay, the technology that we consume, it's manufactured outside the U.S. The brain trusts that come up with that technology to be, you know, manufactured. Uh, yes, that is here in the U.S., but guess what? That, those are people. They could move overseas very easily. Uh, there's nothing in the U.S. that 
we offer that would um, that can't really be offered elsewhere um, for us for corporations. And so, um, so the you know the lack of thought in mobility um, when they're proposing ninety percent tax on corporations was just I, I don't know how that escaped them. Uh, but that would be a huge deficit to the U.S. That would be detrimental if all these companies left. Uh, and, of course, again, why would they stay? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So there's nothing legally or physically binding to these, com these companies to stay within the U.S. if we were to tax them at 90%. So, again, the funding mechanism mechanisms just aren't there uh, to support this type of proposal. So this is why... Uh, it didn't pass, that, uh, but the reason I'm talking about this is, again, I told you that I'd talk about it, but because I don't think that this is going to go away. I, um, right after the uh, vote uh, was held for the Green New Deal, um, the representative that proposed this bill um, ended up having a town hall to talk about the Green New Deal. So I don't think that they're done. I think that they're going to keep pushing on this um, and they're going to try to make some um, changes, which if they want to, this to be taken seriously, it needs to have changes. I don't, I don't know where these numbers came from. You know, the uh, green energy sector doesn't support these numbers. Uh, 29 million, where did that even come from? I don't even know how they came to that conclusion of that number. Um, and where did the 10 year time frame come from? Uh, again, I don't know where all of these numbers came from. I guess the 10 year is mostly for, at least as far as the green initiatives are concerned, because uh, the representatives stated that in 12 years time that uh, the earth would be completely un unsustainable, life would be unsustainable on earth. And so that's where the 10 year time frame came in, I guess. But uh, but really, again, if you look at and read this proposal as a whole, it's the green part is really just a part. The vast majority of the whole proposal was really to overhaul the entire U.S. economy. Um, and so and to do that in 10 years, again, as I've said before, it's just not feasible. So so. There's the there's that with the Green New Deal. Again, I don't think we've heard the last of it, um, but um, but it is dead in the water for right now. Um, we'll see if they uh, you know how they try to revive it. But as of right now, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, so there's that. All right, really quick economic update. So as I stated before, last quarter of last year, okay, it was just uh, all fluff, which is why the markets have come back up very nicely this quarter, the first quarter of 2019. Uh, the Dow has, you know, gone over uh, the 26,000 mark. It is, reach, you know, now going into record high territory. Um, so that's, uh, you know, all good news. Um, the yield curve which I'm going to have to do a video about this because it is really a fun topic. Uh, but I'll talk about that later because I don't want to try to do multiple topics into one video. So, but we will do a video on that. Um, the yield curve went negative, which is an indicator that we will hit recession uh, status soon. Now, this is very interesting because, and I'll talk about this further in, you know, the separate video when I talk about the yield curve, but just to give you guys an idea, um, it has been a predictor of recessions and it has been correctly a predictor of recessions since the 1960s. Um, and the problem now, though, uh, is that its predictive power is going to be altered. And the reason I say that is because now people are paying attention. The reason it was so um, effective in its predictability is because people were not paying attention to it. They didn't react to it. They didn't know about it. But now that we are aware of it, now people's behavior will change because they of this known variable. And so then, then our behavior changes, then that influences the variable. So you could see how this could be kind of a, you know, interesting topic and how it can 
B, it can cause interesting results. So, um, so that will be actually interesting to, I keep saying interesting, it's late, I'm tired, but uh, it will be fun to watch actually. So, um, all right, so there's that. And again, in the foreseeable future, the markets are doing fine. We'll continue to push upward. Um, again, not in huge leaps and bounds, but we'll continue to push upward steadily, which is a good thing. Uh, Brexit. <laughs> what is there to say about Brexit? It was supposed to happen. Uh, they've had issues with it. I mean, it's like the never ending story. It's like it just keeps going. Uh, so we'll see. Um, I guess, you know, recently there have been talks that have been successful. We'll see how this goes. But they were supposed to have this completed in March. Uh, and it's, you know, well into April and it's still going on. Anyways, uh, so there's that for you. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, let me know in the comment section below. Um, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and we'll keep talking about all the fun little uh, topics that are coming up um, here and there. And then, of course, we'll continue to look at everything through the economic lens. And uh, I will talk with you guys later.